Thank you so much. Um, because all this stuff is coming at us, because there are so many new technologies, new ideas, because every day somebody new comes along and says, everything you thought you knew is rubbish, we're changing the world. I think it's important always to keep coming back to what we really know and to what we can really be sure of and to great ideas that are, that are out there that are still going to be great ideas, even if some of them are not patented. And so I want to bring us back in this talk to stuff that we know matters and stuff that we know we have to deal with wherever we, wherever we plan cities. So if you know my shtick, you know this question. How many adult elephants will fit in a wine glass? Notice the feeling of certainty you have about your answer to that question. Notice that that certainty is pretty impervious because it's pretty inseparable from the basic idea of an elephant and the basic idea of a wine glass that the answer to this question has to be what it is. Now, my friends in the big data world will come at me now and say, how dare you just insult, how dare you just, in, in, just say, just claim that you know how many elephants would fit in a wine glass? Where's your study? And we could take some wine glasses down to the zoo and actually do this experiment, but we don't. And the reason we don't is that we know we are in the presence of something called axiomatic certainty. Now think about this question. In 2050, how many adult elephants will fit in a wine glass? Feel your certainty about that. Congratulations, the future is so uncertain, but you just made a prediction. Pretty darn solid prediction about what the world of 2050 will be like. How did you do that? How could you be so sure? So the answer, of course, is that this is geometry. You recognize this statement as an example of a general principle that objects do not fit in containers that are smaller than themselves. And you recognize that the world is unimaginable if that were not true. And so we feel pretty darn sure about this to the point that you probably couldn't even get a grant to do the proper study of taking wine glasses to the zoo. Philosophers would call this axiomatic certainty, which is a fancy name for a thing that is basically impossible to doubt because it is intrinsic to the, very, to, our, to the very most basic concepts of reality. Concepts of reality, by the way, that have been very well tested through evolution. People, uh, organisms have survived and prospered precisely in part because they are clear that large, or, that large things do not fit in small containers. Pretty certain stuff. So now with apologists to all of the brilliant technologists in the room, and the brilliant things they have to offer, I want to, I want to gently suggest that one thing that technology is not going to change is geometry. <clears throat> so you've all seen this image. This is a bus, and this is how much space it takes if 60 people go down a street using a bus. This is how much space these same people take if they are in private cars, and this should remind you of elephants and wine glasses, shouldn't it? There are only so many cars that fit in a street, and then the street is full, and then nobody else can move. Now we can talk about technological innovations that could transform this, and so here's what the world looks like when everybody's in Uber and Lyft. <laughs> Except, of course, it's a little bit worse. And I just had a, I had a great exchange on Twitter recently with Andrew Salzberg of Uber, and let me just try to lay it out. Mathematically, the immediate fact of people getting out of private cars and into Uber and Lyft is that the car no longer has to be parked, but it does have to drive from one job to another. That driving from one job to another is new vehicle miles that we did not have when we simply drove our own cars to our destinations. So what Uber and Lyft is immediately doing, mathematically, geometrically, right away, is reducing parking demand but increasing demand for lane space. And, we're, and so it should not surprise us that we're seeing it correlate with increasing congestion in a lot of cities. Now you can then make a psychological or secondary argument about, yes, but this will change people's attitudes toward cars. It will, 
make diff vehicle ownership uh, uh, patterns different, that may help down the line, all great. But those are psychological or arguments, and those are ephemeral, <laughs> extremely doubtable compared to the absolute certainty we have about what's going on geometrically, what's going on spatially, which is that yes, Uber and Lyft have to drive from one place to another, and from one job to another, and that's more vehicle miles than when we drove our cars ourselves. Now here's what it looks like with driverless cars. But this is also much worse than it appears because of a phenomenon that you may have heard called induced demand. And I don't tend to use that word with the general public because I want to make it clear how brutally obvious this is. Induced demand is the principle that if you make something easy, people will do it more. People will drive more if they don't have to deal with the hassle of driving. They will, they will um, and as a result, any space that is saved by, for example, autonomous cars running closer together, gets consumed by many more people driving, uh, choosing to use these vehicles, and as a result, we end up in the same space we were in before in terms of congestion. It's important to understand what induced demand is. Uh, it, it sounds like economics because of the word we used. It's biology. In fact, it's absolutely axiomatic biology. I defy you to doubt it. Because one thing that absolutely every organism is, every, every organism of any kind has this problem that it has to get resources to have energy, but it has to spend less energy than it's going to get from the resource. It has to run a positive balance sheet, right? So of course an organism is going to get its resources in the easiest possible way. Of course. And what's more, secondary induced demand when, there, when a resource is abundant, organisms reproduce around it. Like when you build a new highway, and Walmarts and, and hotels and, and, and subdivisions grow around it, just like barnacles on a rock, right? It's, it's in the presence of a resource the organism reproduces until it exhausts the resource. So the biology tells us that the exhaustion of the resource is ultimately where it ends up always. That's how biology works. You get to near exhaustion of the resource, and then you stop growing, and then that's your reality. So you have to presume the exhaustion of the resource, which is why uh, running cars a little closer together doesn't make me feel better about the future of cities, which is why I think we're going to end up with the driverless bus and the driverless train, assuming we have driverless, uh, we have driverless technology, L5. It's a simpler problem than the driverless car. It goes far fewer places. And of course, we have driverless, we've had driverless trains for a long time. Vancouver has been running them in service for over 30 years. Now, the reason this is hard to focus on is that people are always asking, how does it all fit together? Show us the picture of how everything fits together in 2030 or whatever. What's the city going to be like? And I want to say, no, do the opposite. It's fun to, vi to visualize the future as all this comes together, but if you want to make clear decisions for your community, you have to think about the pieces separately because they're remarkably separable. There are four big problems of urban transportation. There's the problem of communications, info, when and where needed, for which the solution is in apps and information technology, and this has been absolutely transformative for transit, the quality of information we now have about where buses are and what they're doing. Is the pro there are problems of emissions and the efficient use of energy for which the solution is going to be electric vehicles. There's a problem of the efficient use of labor and safety for which the solution is going to be autonomous vehicles. And unrelated to those, independent of those, there is the problem of the efficient use of space in dense cities for which the solution is going to be big vehicles. Actually, there are two solutions. One is for people to share rides in big vehicles, and they have to be big because we need lots of people to share rides in a dense city or you have to travel using a vehicle that's not much bigger than your body, a bicycle or a scooter. So those two things are actually very complementary. And by the way, they, they specialize in different trip distances. Transit is a little more specialized toward a longer trip distance. So it all works together. But one of my problems here is that the fourth, this fourth idea, the big vehicle that's capable of serving lots of people in very little space, it's not patented. There aren't huge public relations budgets out there promoting the basic idea of big vehicles carrying lots of people on fixed routes. We take it for granted. We think of it as old, which is just to say that, yes, indeed, it wasn't invented in the last 10 minutes. It's not patented. 
but that doesn't make it a bad idea. It makes it an essential idea. In fact, I think it's one of the great ideas in the history of transportation, one of the three or four greatest ideas of all, because it is a geometric solution to a geometric problem. And when we understand our problems geometrically, we understand them the way we understand elephants and wine glasses, and we are really, really sure about that. There's nothing wrong with empty buses. This is a common thing I hear all the time. All those empty buses that look so wasteful. No, operating cost is mostly labor, therefore it's efficient to have a bus that's too big rather than too small. A transit agency that is running buses with lots of empty seats is being smart and efficient with your tax dollars. It's much worse to try to run a small vehicle that then gets overloaded. You have to pull out another vehicle or whatever. Now, the real challenge, the biggest challenge, and what I do most of the time is redesign, is help cities think about redesigning bus systems. And the first thing we have to do is have a conversation about what you're trying to do. Because you listen to the media and you think that transit agencies are trying to maximize their ridership. Their ridership is falling. Transit ridership is falling. What are they doing wrong? You assume that's what they're trying to do. But in fact, somewhere between, somewhere around 60% of all of the public transit service in the U.S. is trying to maximize its ridership. The other 40% is doing other predictably low ridership things. And I call those coverage as opposed to ridership. Because the way we get ridership is to concentrate really good service just in the places where, we have ev where everything is favorable. It's dense, it's walkable, it's straight lines. And there we get fantastic ridership. Run up and down a main street in Philadelphia and you can be doing 80 passengers an hour, picking up more than one person a minute with an ordinary bus. But a high ridership network, a ridership uh, uh, is, a, is one that has chosen its customers. It's chosen which markets it will enter so lots of other people don't get served. And that's not acceptable to them. And they complain about that. They have lifeline needs. That's great. So we have this other thing we do, which is called coverage, where we spread it out and run a little bit of service everywhere. But spreading it out means spreading it thin. As a result, we don't have very good frequencies in those places, so not many people ride. So, so we have predictably low ridership services. Don't let anyone tell you that the low ridership of a transit service means it's failing. It may mean it's doing exactly what it was designed to do, which is a non-ridership thing. Now let me ask you another big question. Do human beings value freedom? And now how about this question? In 2050, will human beings still value freedom? I feel pretty sure about this one, and yet it's not geometry, obviously. We're talking about human beings. Why do I feel so sure about this? Because it's biology. Mammals, birds, reptiles, even insects, everything that's remotely related to us or remotely like us in the way of an animal need to move. Going places is intrinsic to how they live and how they survive and whatever joy they experience. They need physical freedom. They need the ability to go places, and they'll experience its absence as bondage or death. This also, by the way, is history, legend, and literature, and one of the reasons you should hire literature students is that they will constantly be pointing out when some conversation you're having is actually a conversation that people have been having from the dawn of time, which is helpful perspective. Um, and, and, this is a, this, and freedom is part of a, of a human story that you can f track as far back into literature and legend as you want to. So what is physical freedom? It's this idea. If you can't go places, you can't do things. Therefore, your ability to go places is intrinsic to your freedom to have choices and opportunities in your life. It's a way of talking about transportation that makes it clear it's about something much bigger than transportation. It's about what you will be able to do in your life. Because where you can go is what you can do when we're talking about any kind of freedom other than the ones you can exercise on the internet. So here's a hypothetical person. My friends at Remix call her Jane. Uh, this is Ireland, so I think she's called Fiona. But in any case, she's a hypothetical, abstract person who's been plunked down in Dublin, Ireland. Happens to be next to the university, but I could plunk her down anywhere. And in the existing transit system, that's where she can get to in 45 minutes on public transit plus walking. So if she doesn't own a car and she chooses to rely on public transport or is in the financial position where that makes sense for her, this is the wall around her life, just like the wall of a prison. Outside this wall are jobs she can't hold, schools she can't go to, people she probably won't meet. So if we make this bigger, 
as we're proposing to do in a network plan that we're doing for Dublin right now, she has more freedom. We are liberating her, quite literally. And we can show exactly what that is. We can show that Jane at that location can get to 95,000 more jobs, 43% more jobs. That's 43% more opportunity. And you can track with that, of course, shopping, clubs, all sorts of other things probably grow to the same degree because that whole blue area that we've added and the little red area that we've lost adds up to that much expansion in liberty. And here's the cool thing. This is a purely geometric calculation. I have needed no psychology. I have needed no social science. Those are great disciplines, and I admire them. We get great work out of them, but they'll never be as certain as we are about geometry. And that's how sure we are about this, because this is a purely geometric calculation from where people are, where jobs are, and where the network is. How did we do this? It's the sort of thing we do. Here's the existing bus network in inner north Dublin. The thing to note is that red means a bus every 15 minutes, soon enough that it's always coming soon. And what you see is that there's not very much, and also that the network is very squiggly and complicated with lots of infrequent lines overlapping each other. This is, bef this is existing. This is what's proposed. Before, after, before, before, after, network becomes much simpler. Almost all the lines are frequent. And as a result, even though you may have to change buses, the next bus is always coming soon. And that's how we get you to so many more places. Now, I want you to notice that if you actually want to make the most of your freedom, if you actually want to be able to go as far, as, you know, as, far as, you, as you can, it helps to not have opinions about things like whether you're going to be on rails or tires, whether you're going to have to change from a bus to a train or change buses. All those other red lines that people bring to transit, I would never change buses, I would never walk, I would never ride a bus, I would only ride a train. You can bring all those ultimatums to this tool, and all of them will make your freedom smaller, right? Because with each one of those red lines you bring, you cut off certain opportunities for yourself. So it's a way to help people focus on what if we actually just wanted the freedom? And what if we actually designed networks that were civilized and functional, regardless of whether they're on rails or tires, so that people can go wherever they want to go and to as many places as possible so that they are free, or as free as we can make them? So this is pretty ominous when you think about it for those of us who do transportation. Transportation planning is freedom planning. We are deciding who will be free and how free they will be. Whoa. Not all of us may have signed up for that. But that's really what it is, isn't it? So freedom is, for, is three things. It's a thing every organism needs. I defy you as not to care about it. Second, it's a thing we can predict, unlike ridership or development outcomes. We can predict freedom because it's a mathematical calculation from the geography. And it's a thing outside the triple bottom line. How many of us have sat in evaluation processes or read evaluation processes and, and, and dutifully checked off the boxes of the triple bottom line? What's the economic impact? What's the sustainability or environmental impact? What's the social or equity impact? There's a thing missing. And I won't ask for a show of hands about who in this room self-identifies as a conservative, but I talk to a lot of conservatives, and they point out what's missing. And when I listen to conservatives talk, they remind me what's missing. What's missing is that the three elements of the triple bottom line, environmental, economic, and social, all sound like the outcomes of people doing what the bureaucrat predicted they would do or encouraged they could do, them to do. They sound like the result, the product of a successfully managed society. And that just gets under some people's skin. Because for some people, there's a fourth thing that's missing. And I think it's a thing that we may not mention because those of us who are relatively fortunate are able to take it for granted, are able to secure it for ourselves. And that's the simple sensation of freedom, the sensation that you that you wake up in the morning and there are choices and opportunities before you. And that as you move through the day, there are choices and opportunities and you can do different things depending solely on, what, on who you are and what you want. Freedom, in other words, is the only thing, it's not only the only thing we really can predict in the long term, it's the only thing we should have the audacity to predict in the long run. What does it mean when our predictive models say how many people will ride this rail line in 2040, 20 years from now. What do we say? Well, the only way we predict human behavior 
in the future is to look at human behavior now. So we have to assume as a baseline assumption that human behavior doesn't change. In other words, we have to assume, young people, we're assuming that when you're the same age that your parents are now, you will behave exactly the way they do, right? Because our prediction of how you will behave in 2040 when you are 50 is based on how your parents are behaving now when they are that age. We have to assume that you are a copy of your parents, that we live in a completely deterministic process where, where children never innovate, where children never do something different from what their parents did. It's not a very good assumption. Freedom, though, freedom is something we can predict. So here's the thing. The key feature about a city is that freedom has to be shared. And this is so different from the rural experience of freedom. So here's Abraham Lincoln. Those who would deny freedom to others deserve it not for themselves. Here's a picture of Lincoln's idea. Because what's happening there? You're stuck in traffic. Those people are obstructing your freedom precisely in the act of you obstructing theirs. You are not stuck in traffic. You are traffic, right? It's the same thing. Denying freedom and losing freedom are the same thing in this situation. And the more we get into thinking about cities, the more we find that. So the impact of cars depends on where you are. Of course the car is an instrument of rural freedom. It's completely understandable. And anyone who wants to, and, and when we start stupid culture wars about whether cars are a good thing, we're having a stupid culture war about whether rural life is a good thing, which is a stupid thing to be talking about. When we get into the cities, though, the very same vehicle becomes an instrument of tyranny on the freeway and also, by the way, on the city street. On the city street where we've plugged the street with cars and therefore buses and nothing else can really move. Scarce resources need to be shared. And there are two scarce resources in particular. Space is the one that will always be there. And prior to automation, the other is driver labor. Passenger transport is about paying a driver, and how efficiently we use that driver, how many people that driver carries, is fundamental to how many people we're liberating. Again, an ordinary city bus driving down a street in a typical two-story mature city like Philadelphia can pick up 80 people an hour. Keep that number in the back of your mind and think about how other things, other options out there compare to that. So the key to urban freedom, I'm sorry, is still the old, unpatented, but brilliant idea of the fixed route network. Because the rigidity of, have you heard, oh, those rigid fixed routes, those are the results of rigid minds, and the new world is all about being flexible? Doesn't that sound great? Total nonsense. It is the rigidity of the fixed route that gives you so much flexibility. It is because you have a network of fixed routes that are always coming soon, that you, can, that you can walk to one of them and navigate through that network to go wherever you're going. And it's a good thing that the thing is rigid. It's a good thing that it's doing the same thing tomorrow as it did today. Imagine life as a motorist if the freeways were completely different every time you got out of the garage. No. We like the fact that it's rigid. The fact that it's rigid means we can learn it and navigate it and go where we need to go while also using a service that is spectacularly efficient as fixed routes are. The other great thing about fixed routes is that they can scale. As we all know, one of the problems with cars is that the more we use them, the less they work, right? Because as we get more and more cars, we get in each other's way and it stops working. The more we use transit, the better it works because it's very easy to keep scaling up the fixed route, keep adding frequency. Eventually, you turn the fixed route into a bus route, a transit line, or a rail line. That's easy. That works spatially. That you can always continue to improve on how efficiently you liberate people in limited space. Now I want to bring in our developer friends in the room, our land use planner friends in the room, and ask this question. What if we helped people choose freedom? Because people have a free choice, and they're free to choose things that will in some way limit themselves, but they should choose that consciously. So, 10, 15 years ago, my developer friends were telling me that the key to urban redevelopment is that there have to be railroad tracks in the street. And that the presence of railroad tracks in the street and a vehicle coming along them now and then is an indicator that will trigger lots of people wanting to live there, will trigger redevelopment. And my question at the time, and my question still is, 
What if instead you showed them where they could go from there and sold that? What if we sold them not the presence of a symbol of transit, but the actual ability to go places and do things if you locate in this place? I think almost everything that is wrong with land use in America could be, could be, could be fixed in a, in a fundamentally conservative way, that is, say, allowing everyone to make their own informed choices, if everybody was forced to look at a bunch of blobs of access, a bunch of blobs of where you can go. Here's where you'll be able to get to by car. Here's where you'll be able to get to on transit. And oh, by the way, unlike cars, transit can continue to work <laughs> as the city grows denser. What if we could just make those informed choices? And that would mean, too, that we have to recognize the opposite, recognize landscapes of tyranny. Now, it's not tyranny if you chose this for yourself, and I respect people's right to choose this for themselves, but it is tyranny if you choose it for them. In Chattanooga, Tennessee, the Social Security Office recently really moved from a location in a shopping center next to a transit center to the end of a cul-de-sac in a business park. The clients of the Social Security Office were not invited to comment on the fact that they would now have to spend all day getting to the Social Security Office when before they could just stop by there while they were doing their shopping. Because, and the, because the transit agency is now being bullied to run a bus up the hill to this cul-de-sac and back, but it can't afford to do that very often because it's a terrible geography for transit. And essentially the transit agency, the taxpayer, is being asked to bail out the social security agency for the impacts of its money-saving decision, which was to put its office where the land was cheap because the access is poor, and of course it's its clients who are the ultimate losers from those decisions, and I see that happening all the time. But here, what's this? This is, looks like a perfectly nice new urbanist town center, doesn't it? Our, trees, street lamps, um, high density housing, but it's here. It's in a massive cul-de-sac neighborhood on a hilltop in San Jose, California. And that means that despite its density, it's never going to have really good transit service because what, what really good transit service does is run in straight lines. And it's prohibited us from running in a straight line that lots of other people will find useful. So it's going to have to rely on cars, on Uber, Lyft, whatever. But whatever it is, you're going to get in it and you're going to drive down the hill and you're going to get stuck on that freeway. Because that's intrinsic to having built high density, therefore lots of demand, lots of traffic, in a place where transit, the, the, the most effective way of liberating people at high density, cannot function. And I'm not going to tell you to stop building this, but I would appreciate it, but, I, but we would have a better world if people could be talked through that and understand that when they make these location choices. So to sum up, I want to come back to the certainty we have about elephants and wine glasses. What do we know the way we know that? Because the thing I want you to take away is the certainty of, are, are some things that we are as sure about as we are sure about that. It's that in a city, we free ourselves only by freeing others. As we've seen on the freeway, seeking freedom with cars imprisons ourselves, imprisons others, and those are the same act. So it is only by liberating others that we liberate ourselves, which is exactly what incredibly, cost what incredibly effective fixed route transit does in cities. Particularly, we have to share space. And here's the moment when I have to, when I have to say to my friends who are coming and telling me what customers want, what the next thing is, what the trend is. Yeah, I know customers want a direct ride from their doorstep to the doorstep of their destination. I would like Santa Claus to exist, too. I would like the Tooth Fairy to exist. In the adult world, we have trade-offs, and we understand that there are limits, because we understand that, the, that even no matter how many customers want to be able to put an elephant in a wine glass, it doesn't mean we can. So there's always the tr it's always not just what the customer wants, but what there is room for. And quite honestly, if what you want is more than your fair share of space or more than your fair share of driver labor, then by all means pay the private sector for that. And then by all means let's organize our streets so that 
the buses can get through. And then there's room for you if you want to pay more, pay more to have something like that and you can fit it down the street, go ahead. But we have to be concerned about the fact in a city, we have to be concerned about the fact that it has to work for everyone or it doesn't work. Force a low-income person to drive a car and that, by giving them terrible transit, and that puts their car in front of you blocking, you, blocking your Lexus in traffic. It becomes your problem. That's a unique feature of the city. We must share space. We must share driver labor pre-automation. And we must help people locate for freedom. We must help people see and choose freedom when they locate. And I would love to live in a world where that's ultimately what the real estate and development and land use worlds are doing, is helping create cities where we can all, where we can each be free, because we are all more free. Thank you very much.